sorry about that. So Newton realized that the mathematics at the time wasn't good enough, so he just sat down and invented calculus, which is most amazing because you learn calculus for years. We learn it in, um, at university, and then it became analysis, and it's all a big, big subject area. But in the sense, there was this most famous person who just said, hmm, mass isn't good enough. I just do it, and then I use it to describe the motion of planets. Then came, well, many, many hundreds of years, sort of nothing, and then Einstein came. And I will tell you a bit about Einstein, because he is really a very interesting figure in the sciences. I will talk to you a bit about special relativity. I'll show you two nice movies. One is a relativistic roller coaster ride, which I think is, is very nice. Then I tell you a bit of general relativity and then about cosmology. And the punchline will be that 96% of cosmology is not understood. And this is actually quite frustrating. And um, maybe another comment is, why is it that mathematicians sometimes don't dare to go into this field? Well, Einstein wrote down the field equations in 1915, and, or 1916, and for about 80 years, no mathematician dared to touch them. They were just too hard. So physicists did it by ignoring all the subtleties and just guessed something, which is what physicists do. They just brush forward, and mathematicians, no, you can't do this, and then it all works out in the end. But actually, mathematicians now have started to work sort of on the subtleties of this and, and take it sort of to the next level. So who's Einstein? Well, you have seen these various pictures of him. And what you see on the blackboard there is actually the vacuum field equations of general relativity. And when you see something like capital R with two indices IK, you think to yourself, well, that's not too bad. I can do this. Um, unfortunately, these equations are really long. If you print them out, it is about 20 pages of paper in a small 10-point script. But they can be nicely summarized and look rather harmless. Um, if you see the full shot of the picture, there are people in the background scratching their heads because they actually don't get it. And the reason for this is it is simply complicated. And people back then predicted it would take like 100 years to find the first solution to this equation. In fact, it only took one year. And to date, we know roughly two and a half to 3,000 solutions to this one equation up there. And actually, we don't know how many, equation, how many solutions there exist. We can't classify them because it's sort of a well, it's 20 pages long, so it's sort of tricky. And actually, nobody has any idea whether we'll ever stop creating new solutions. But you can buy a book. It's about this thick. It tells you all the solutions we know of, 3,000 of them. And if you work long enough in this field, you write your own solution at some point. Uh, it might not be the most interesting one, but you can do it. Um, but what made Einstein famous? Actually, in 1905, he did something that was most extraordinarily. He published four papers. One about the photoelectric effect. He confirmed atomic theory. He, well, invented special relativity. And then he derived this mass equivalence principle. And you have all seen this equation. I think it's known to be the, most, the best known equation in the world, E equals mc squared. Um, if you were a researcher today and you would manage to write one of these papers, you basically get the Nobel Prize within a couple of years. He changed the world with four most amazing papers in just one year. So if I would be able to write half of such a paper, I, I would be pretty famous. I, I haven't done it, so I'm not famous. Sorry. Um, can't do more than that. But so it is, it is most amazing that, that he managed to revolutionize physics, theoretical physics, um, within a single year. And I don't know. If you think about it, you actually you can't get your head around that. And what did he do then? Well, he revolutionized physics already and was extremely famous. And then he went away, worked for 10 years, and 10 years later managed to come up with general relativity, which is what he's now actually even more famous for. So he managed, after being really a genius, to, he actually pushed himself even further and managed to generalize Newtonian gravity and to derive a theory which is exactly this, this long, complicated equation. And interestingly, he was strongly influenced, actually, by two people, Marcel Grossman and Levi Civita, who is an Italian geometer who sort of laid partially the foundations of modern differential geometry, which, which he needed to derive this theory. And this is also partially why this is done sort of in math departments. The mathematics you need to do general relativity is called differential geometry. And for instance, at UCL, this is a fourth year course. 
So after four years of maths, you know enough maths to do physics, which is, which is rather strange and very counterintuitive, because you think physics is easy, because all you do maths. But it isn't. The, the real interesting stuff is extremely hard and really interesting. And well, in 1915, he published this paper, The Field Equations of Gravitation, and there they were. And he did this basically using superhuman intuition. If you try to understand all the steps that he made, it is sort of easy once you know the answer. But if you imagine that you were that person doing this, some people describe it as he was being blindfolded and swimming on the water with his hands tied to his back. Um, it's a pretty accurate description. Um, but he managed to do it, which is most amazing. And these are these equations written out in full. So this is the same thing as this RIK I've written down. These are the full field equation, and they look actually reasonably harmless. Um, the left-hand side is usually referred to as the geometrical side. So it describes, in some sense, the curvature of the space. I'll give you a few nice pictures about this in a minute. So here you really imagine some kind of curved space, a bit like a bed sheet, and you throw something into the bed sheet. And on the right-hand side here, don't worry about the 8 pi. This is just cosmetics. Um, on the right-hand side, you have the matter. And, and the way to read these equations, I will say this again later, is in some sense, the space, this curvature bit here, is told what to do by the matter. So if you have a certain matter contribution, the space will sort of adapt to it. And pictures will make this a bit nicer in a minute. So let me mention two other facts. So when he became a bit older, um, he started to refuse, strangely enough, some theories for which he laid the foundation. So he's most known for refusing quantum theory. Subsequently, he refused quantum field theory. And it is all summarized in a famous citation of him, which says, God does not play dice. And the really strange thing about this is he himself laid the foundations of quantum theory, mainly by managing to correctly describe the photoelectric effect, which requires energy to come in little quanta. So he did this. And well, 30 years later, he said, oh, 40, 42 years later, he said, I don't like it anymore. And I refuse it categorically. Um, unfortunately, um, that was definitely the wrong way, because quantum field theory is actually the best tested theory we have. So let me show you a little picture of what the main idea of special relativity is. So you might have seen a picture like this. The idea behind here is you have a man or a person who's standing in a train and flashes a little torch. And there is a little light pulse. Let me get my beamer back. There is a little light pulse emitted from the torch, this thing here, that travels in the direction of the train. And the train itself is moving with a certain velocity. And then you have a person watching this whole thing. So I'll give you this example firstly with the little, imagine you have a little rubber ball, which you bounce on the floor in the train. If I did this, if I do this here, you can actually, uh, let's imagine the table. So if I, if I have my rubber ball and bounce it and move at the same time, what you see is, looks a bit like a triangle, so little triangles. And the way to explain this classically is, well, it is the train that makes the rubber ball, well, move faster along the line of the traveling train. And therefore, the rubber ball basically travels quicker. And everybody is happy with this. You can do exactly the same argument with the slide pulse. You say, well, I have here my little laser. I mean, you can't see it, unfortunately. But imagine I had a little mirror on top here. I would, if I do it like this, you see this. So imagine I just imagine this little bound. So it goes up and down. And if I move forward, this would also describe a triangular shape. The main assumption of special relativity, and in fact, strongly, strongly confirmed by experiment, is that the speed of light is not allowed to change. And this has a very, very crucial consequence. What I'm saying now is I'm not allowed to fiddle with the speed of light. Therefore, when I do this and walk at the same time, the speed that the light travels at is not allowed to change. And this is now a really crucial point, because the length of this triangle is, of course, longer than the length of the light ray going up and down. So the length is bigger. 
I'm not allowed to change the velocity because I basically say this is constant. So I have to change something else. And the only thing I'm, is now left to change, you know, velocity is distance divided by time. Velocity is fixed. Distance has become bigger. So to keep velocity constant, I have to change time. So this very simple or very crucial assumption of saying you can't make light travel any faster than it is already traveling immediately implies that time has to change in sort of moving bodies. And this seemed revolutionary um, at the beginning of the previous century. And these days, we are very much used to this. And although the effects of this are small, you basically all know one particular real life application where this really matters, and this is GPS. So GPS has to take into account that the speed of light is constant. Otherwise, you would end up in Paris if you thought you were in Camden. Because over years, this tiny, tiny effect here would sort of gradually add up and make your GPS readings worse and worse. Let me show you a little animation now. So what I'm showing you is a um, relativistic roller coaster ride. And why do I do this? Well, you will not experience in real life sort of relativistic effects. I mean, GPS, I can tell you about it, but you can't really feel it. And you cannot feel any other relativistic effects. But a couple of years ago, some people came together and decided to do um, this relativistic roller coaster, where they make the roller coaster artificially fast, or they make actually the speed of light much slower, so that you can see all these effects that happen due to the very, very single observation that the speed of light cannot change. And this changes everything extremely radically. And after about five seconds of into this movie, you will actually be lost. You have all done a roller coaster ride, although most of you will have probably done one. Um, about five or 10 seconds into this roller coaster ride, you will not get it anymore. And I've watched about 50 times. And I can tell you there are, there are lots of parts that I don't yet fully understand because there are so many effects coming together in this video. And the only thing I want you to, to keep an eye out is you see sometimes the sides of you moving forwards as if the whole universe is sort of focusing in front of you. So if you have a watch out for this, this is the easy, easiest effect to be spotted. So as promised, there is a point at which you are completely lost, and you just think to yourself, well, it looks a bit like a roller coaster ride, but all the details seem to be completely blurred. Um, when the pictures became sort of more black and white, this is not an accident. It's not my computer being slow. This is actually the true relativistic effect. So frequencies change due to all these relativistic effects and high velocities. And your perception of colors will simply change. So this is actually a rather realistic visualization, um, should we ever have a relativistic roller coaster, which we won't in the near future anyway. But it is sort of, it is so strange if you see this that it actually makes you, makes you really wonder how this theory works. Um, there is this very famous twin paradox. So I've told you already that if you are on this train, then your time, your notion of time has to change mainly because the velocity of, of light is con or the speed of light is constant, therefore you have to sort of change the time. And this leads to this very interesting paradox. So if you have two twins and one starts out on a journey and travels with a very, very high velocity, 
then he will age slower than someone at rest. So if you take this to the extreme, you could easily travel into the future. You just get into a quick, into a very fast spaceship. You travel for like 10 or 20 years, and when you come back to Earth, maybe 80 or 100 years have passed. And we can confirm this experimentally. There's nothing wrong with it. There's also nothing wrong with it philosophically, because if you travel into the future, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, traveling into the past is, of course, not OK, because there's the old paradox of if you traveled into the past and did something to one of your ancestors, what would happen to you? So traveling into the past has lots of problems. Traveling into the future is absolutely fine, because you leave here. People might miss you or not. But you get into the spaceship, you fly off, and at some point you come back. A and that's the end of the story. Um, you might be sort of, you might find it quite difficult to adapt in 100 years if you're still 20 and you don't know what's going on. But in principle, there is neither a philosophical problem with traveling into the future, nor is there actually a real practical problem. And um, if you basically, if you start walking, you travel into the future. But the effect is so small that it doesn't change your life in any way. And I think here I'm giving, I'm giving you a few little numbers to show you what's going on. So the equation that you can derive, so you can do this on one piece of paper, and you can do this exactly by using the triangle on the train, and you compare it with the straight line up and down from the person in the train, and you arrive at this little equation, which is not too difficult. So you have here the time measured by the moving observer versus the time measured by the observer at rest. And the difference between the two is given by this factor here, which is the square root of mun minus speed squared divided by speed of light squared. So let's put a few numbers into this equation. And if you put a few numbers in, you actually see um, very much how big the difference is. So this is pretty much the speed of light, so around 300,000 meters per second. And now we compare. This, this equation that we've just had, which tells you the difference between the two times here. We do this for a car, a supersonic jet, and a space shuttle. Just plug in the numbers and look at the answer and see what happens. So we have a speeding car. Um, please don't do this. It's too quick. It's only 70 on motorways. Um, supersonic jet, I've never been in one. Maybe if you're lucky, you'll manage. Space shuttle, well, even rarer to get on one of those. So let's have a look what happens. You put this into your calculator, straightforward tapping exercise, and you end up with largely disappointing numbers. The difference between the time in the car and the time outside the car, if you were speeding, um, well, there are lots and lots and lots and lots of zeros, and then there's a one. So even if you were speeding all your life, yeah, you wouldn't even gain a fraction of a fraction of a second. So it's not worth speeding. Absolutely not. Um, Supersonic jets, well, if you just look, there are many, many, many zeros. And then again, basically nothing. So even if you travel on a supersonic jet all your life, sorry, you, you won't make any difference. I mean, it doesn't make any difference as to your age with respect to the age of the people who stay behind. And even if you travel in the space shuttle all your life, it will make no difference whatsoever, which means a single space shuttle trip will not make any change to the time differences. So the conclusion to this is rather simple, that special relativity does not affect our everyday life, which is why we have to basically program a computer and make a nice simulation to sort of get a feeling of these effects if we could experience those. So again, as I said, when you talk about time travel into the future, no problem at all. Into the past, it doesn't work unless you create a model where your time actually bends in something like a circle. If you have a circular time where time goes round, you would actually be able to travel into the past. And, but this has lots of other rather weird implications. And we don't seem to live in a universe where time goes in a circle. And all the evidence suggests that time is very much a straight line as we sort of imagine it. Um, this mass energy equivalence, E equals mc squared, has also a few effects, most of them rather small. So when a flashlight or my little laser pointer here emits light, which it does, it loses mass. So because 
this equivalence between energy and mass involves this factor of speed of light squared. This is a very large number. So therefore, this effect is actually extremely small, because you somehow divide by a, small, by a big number. Um, so I can press this button all my life, and I will never, ever sense the loss of weight of this laser pointer. And the best scales we have in the world will never be able to tell us what's, that there's any light change going on. The, sa the same, you could try this at home. You take a flower, you put it on a scale, and it should get heavier when it absorbs sunlight. Again, the effects are so small, you will never be able to observe this, unfortunately. However, um, it gets slightly more interesting when you take this to an atomic level. So if you have a nucleus and you split it into two, their relative masses will be slightly smaller. So there is a mass difference. And this mass difference creates light, heat, and kinetic energy. And most of you will probably know what happens then. If you do this smartly, it gives you a very big boom. This is the way you build a nuclear bomb, basically. You, you take a big lump of radioactive material, and you start a very controlled process where one nucleus decays. It creates two partners, but it remains also two other, well, little particles that induce further um, decays. And then you end up with a chain reaction, which has actually very devastating effects. Um, as you see here, picture sponsored by the US Department of Energy. You can download it from Google. So, Let me tell you a bit of general relativity. So this is where this stuff becomes really interesting, because here you have this intricate interplay between geometry on one side and some physics on the other side. So what is visualized here, so this is meant to be the sun. There you have the Earth. And here you have a satellite which is near Saturn. And what the satellite does is emits a signal towards the Earth, and it passes by the Sun. And what you see here, these blue rings, they try to indicate the gravitational potential, or in some sense, the curvature of this space, or we call it space-time. Because what you do is you, you, you leave this Newtonian picture of having God with the clock and then a three-dimensional space, but there is no absolute time anymore, but you mix this into a four-dimensional space. This space is curved. And I can't visualize it either. So nobody can, or I've n not met a person who can actually visualize a four-dimensional space. You just have to accept it as an abstract concept. And at some point, you get used to the idea. You still can't visualize it. So the idea is these rings here indicate the curvature of the space-time. And as you see, near the sun, the, the, the gravitational potential is bigger, so the curvature is bigger. And the signal here gets bent towards the sun. Otherwise, it would just travel in a straight line. Um, Newton's theory of gravity predicts the same thing. Light is bent in Newtonian gravity, but not as much as predicted by general relativity. And in 1922, Eddington um, made a trip to observe a solar eclipse, and he actually was able to confirm Einstein's theory. He, he fudged his result a little bit, but these days we have lots of independent observations that basically confirm that these, the signal travels precisely on the curve predicted by Einstein's theory of general relativity. So these are, again, the field equations. And the way to read these field equations is really, on the left-hand side, you have the properties of a four-dimensional space-time. And on the right-hand side, you have properties of matter. And there's actually an interesting interplay going on. Because on the one hand, because it is an equation, you can read it one way or the other. You can say the right-hand side force, forces the left-hand side to be something, or you say that the left-hand side forces the right-hand side to be something. So one way to read it is that matter, this thing on the right, tells space-time on the left how it has to curve. But you can read the equation the other way, and it is equally valid, namely space-time tells matter how to move. This is precisely what is happening here. It is the curvature of the space-time which tells the light ray how to move in the geometry. So you can't do one without the other. These, these pictures are coupled together. Um, this is a nice little experiment you can try at home. Get a few friends, take a big bed sheet, spread it out, throw in a big, heavy melon, which is this guy here. And then you take a little fruit like an apple and roll it onto the bed sheet. And you will actually do general relativity at home. 
And what will happen is that the apple will follow largely this trajectory here. Due to the friction on the, on the sheet, it will lose energy and will slowly be attracted into this central object, which was your melon. Um, in some sense, you can think about this almost being like a black hole, which um, absorbs surrounding material. So very nice one to do at home. Um, that takes me, of course, straight to black holes. So this is, of course, an artist animation of a black hole. We have never seen a black hole. But what a black hole is, you can explain it quite easily. So you can, we, we just said that an object attracts light naturally due to its gravitational attraction. So you take this further. And the question is, can you make an object, build an object, that has such a strong gravitational pull that it will attract even light, and light can't fly away anymore. Hypothetically, this is possible. And it seems that nature indeed creates these type of objects, which would look black, but you would actually never see something black. And the reason for this, of course, it even attracts light. So there must be lots of action going on around the surface of this black hole, because it attracts so much stuff. So there are lots of particles all <laughs> with each other, colliding, emitting radiation. So it should actually be very bright near the surface or the horizon of this black hole. But how would we see this? Well, astrophysicists, so this is where the real physicists come into the game, they claim that a real black hole should typically look like this. Um, and you have, of course, seen these pictures. It's nothing but a spiral galaxy. And astrophysicists think that there should be a black hole in the center of each and every galaxy that we observe. Um, this is, of course, a pretty long shot. It is very difficult to, to make a statement like this. Um, the mathematical argument is a bit simpler, because you simply look near the center of the spiral galaxy, and you work out how much, or how much density should this material have in order to make the spiral galaxy work. So it's like, you know, density of water. Well, you take mass divided by volume. Here, you just estimate the mass. You make a clever guess. You roughly convince yourself that this is a certain volume. You work out what the energy density or what the density is. And you realize that the density is like millions and millions of times bigger than anything you have ever seen in the world. Which basically tells you, and this is sort of a reverse argument, if the density is that big and we have never seen a material that has such a big density, um, let's just assume for now it is a black hole and then things look OK again. It's, of course, a cheating argument. So um, at the moment, we have no indirect or direct, I mean, indirect, of course, um, but there's no, no real, real experimental suggestion that there should be a black hole, except for some mathematical games you can play and that show that anything that you can imagine, any normal material, can't really do the job of holding the galaxy together. If you take general relativity to the next level, so you see we started with sort of a train. Then you went sort of to the solar system. Now we are on the galaxy scale. So the next question is, can you actually say something about the entire universe? Bold, but you can try to do it. And why not try to use these equations, which were rel relatively simple, and apply them to the entire universe and see if you can make predictions about the history of the entire universe? And interestingly, you can, and you get reasonable answers. And this all goes by the name of cosmology. So cosmology was actually started by the ancient Greeks. They were really interested in sort of understanding the universe as a whole from a more philosophical point of view. But and they invented this word, cosmology, which is a combination of cosmos and logic. And the ancient Greeks called the cosmos an orderly and harmonious system. Um, what we want to do, we have a look at the universe around us, and we see if the Einstein field equations tell us something reasonable about the time evolution of the universe. And this is a, a very hard mathematical problem if you want to do it um, reasonably precisely, because the, the equations are hard. Calculations are difficult. Even computers struggle to do this with a reasonable accuracy. 
So you need to sort of cheat. You throw lots, lots and lots of assumptions in to get a simplified equations you can play with. But doing this on a, on a formal mathematical level is a big and open problem in this field. And very few people have made progress in, in these directions. We think that the universe roughly, or the history of the universe roughly looks like this. It's roughly 14 billion years old. So we are here today. And because the speed of light is some constant, if you look at an object that is far away, the light has traveled quite a while till it reached you. And therefore, you actually see the object in the past. Um, again, it doesn't matter on Earth. However, if you look at the sun, the sun is actually about five light minutes away which means if you look at the sun, what you actually see is the sun five minutes ago. If someone stole the sun during these five minutes, you wouldn't know about it for a while. Well, that is five minutes. And then things would change very rapidly. But there's approximately a five minute delay. And of course, it doesn't really matter too much. But the interesting thing is, if you look at things that are further and further away, effectively, you're looking further and further into the past. So the question is, how far into the past can you actually look? And well, our best satellites can actually look pretty much into the past. They can look back, well, almost 13 billion years, which is a lot. So this, is, this surface here that you see sort of with a couple of colors is the last surface we can possibly observe, because before this surface was formed, the universe was actually opaque. So light couldn't travel, and therefore you can't see it. Um, and you see, this satellite actually manages to see the surface. And what you are interested in is the temperature distribution on the surface. I'll show you the surface here. So this satellite here, which travels, which is just around Earth and just looks in all the directions and try to sort of capture the surface, is actually able to create mm -hmm. this picture here. So the red spots are those where there is a little bit less matter. The blue ones are where there is a little bit of more matter. And the reason why you would like to read it the other way around, if there's more matter in a certain area, then light is kept closer to this area and finds it more difficult to get away. And therefore, you actually see something that is a bit sort of cooler instead of hotter. And um, this stripe here is no surprise. This is nothing but the spiral arm of our galaxy. So you can just take this away and look at the data. And what we are trying to do with this data, we are trying to understand what kind of implications that has um, for the universe as a whole. And some of the implications are, well, if you look here, for instance, and there, it looks roughly the same. If you, if you go outside in the night and look to the left on the sky and on the right, they look roughly the same, which, which tells you sort of that you would hope that the universe is largely homogeneous and isotropic, which means roughly the same in every direction. And it doesn't change too much depending on which direction you look at. However, people noted that there is actually a very dark spot here, and a sort of a bit of a dark spot there. And no, this one up here. It's a bit darker here, a bit darker there. And people try to make models where they put like an axis through the universe and try to say, well, in some sense, this axis seems to be preferred. Um, but again, these are tough mathematical problems to actually write down a model that takes into account such an axis and that then gives reasonable answers. So we think that the universe largely looks like this. You have 73% of dark energy, 23% of dark matter. So fancy names. It doesn't matter what they mean. The interesting bit is this here is us. Yeah, 0.4%. This is the bit we understand, plus a bit of intergalactic gas, which we also roughly understand. So we understand roughly 4%. Um, I don't want to talk much about dark matter, but I can tell you one thing about dark energy. Namely, I can tell you what it is not. <laughs> this is not dark energy. You can, you can buy this in the internet, surprisingly. I don't know why they called it dark energy. Maybe it sells well. That's not dark energy. Otherwise, we don't really know what it is. But depending on how much dark energy you have in the universe, it tells you what will happen with the universe. So it, there was this big bang. We are roughly here somewhere. And the question is, what will happen in the future? And there are three choices. The universe could recollapse. It could just keep expanding nicely. 
or it could expand so rapidly that everything will be dark in the end because everything is just very far away. And at the moment, we don't know what it is. So another open problem that needs to be solved. So wrapping this up, special relativity, general relativity, I think they're highly fascinating subject areas. Some of the first equations you can write down on one piece of paper and start playing with them. Special relativity full of paradoxes, like the twin paradox. Another one is if you run very fast with a ladder on your shoulder, the ladder would shrink due to these relativistic effects. So if your garage is too short for the whole ladder that you fit in, you would think if you run fast enough, you can fit the ladder in. Unfortunately, it won't work. There's always an answer to all these great ideas that people had. Um, general relativity, well, more or less understood, so we know about three and a half thousand solutions. But on a deep fundamental mathematical level, I think it's fair to say that it is not really understood. And more interestingly, so this is where you guys come in, cosmology is 96% not understood. So all you guys can do this. And well, if we get this down to maybe 90 or 80%, then that would be a great achievement. So you are all needed to make this number smaller, because I don't think I will I will see this number getting much smaller. So this is really for the next generations and the generations after to work on making this number smaller so that we all understand a bit more of the world. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. So we have time for some questions, and I'm sure Christian will be very happy to answer them. So any questions, please? Anyone want to work on these 96% <laughs> problems? Uh, to, to, to understand the general relativistic world, you really do need to know mathematics. Uh, it really is a serious, uh, lot of mathematical challenges involved to study this. Yeah, yes. I have a question. Yeah. If, if uh, you said the maths you need to do physics, you'd only learn in the fourth year of a maths degree. How yes. Physicists do degrees. Ah. So th <laughs> the physics degree has been demathematical for over 20, over 30 years almost, which means those that study physics don't do theoretical physics. If you want to do theoretical physics, you study maths, and then you do physics on top of that. Um, if you study a physics degree you will very likely not given the option to do general relativity. And you will never learn the math required to it. it it's, a very sad, it's very sad. <laughs> it's very sad. So what you're saying is mathematics trumps physics. Well, yes, of course it does. <laughs> Any other questions? OK, one thing, thank you very much. Thank you. I neglected to do while you were registering is to hand you a memory stick. So on this stick is uh, the booklet, but in addition you have also the British Applied Mathematics Colloquium. All the titles that they're talking about today, they may not understand some of them, um, but it may be of interest if you want to flip through those as well. So I'll hand these around. Please take one of these sticks and uh, pass it on.
Just make sure that everyone wears the uh, microphone. Yeah, sure. It's mainly for the Linda, do you mind marking up? Uh, because it's for our lecture class. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, how do we do this? Is this the mic? Yeah. And how? What's a good distance usually? I think that's about right. And slip that in your pocket somewhere. So it's probably better to keep it outside my jacket. In my pocket. Sorry, I just need to get past Yeah, so. So is this on yet? I did postdocs um, in Israel at, at Technion yeah. and in Paris as well. Okay. Meanwhile, but yeah, I think it was Oxford, Technion, Paris, Nottingham, and okay. JIT. For the introduction and thanks for the invitation to come and speak. Um, perhaps we can lower the light level a little bit just so they can see better. Um, so yes, today, um, as Rob said, this is back down to earth. There's no cosmology in this talk. It's really about um, the application of mathematics to uh, real-world, everyday kind of problems that arise in industry. Uh, so here's the basic overview of what I'll be talking about. First of all, I want to um, try and convince you of the versatility of mathematics in the real world, how it can be used in everyday problems. Um, I'll then tell you about the background for the particular problem I'm going to focus on today. Um, so really start by telling you about pneumatic liquid crystals, which are used in display devices. What are their key properties? Um, I'll then tell you about conventional LCDs, or liquid crystal displays, and uh, why they have some drawbacks. Although they seem to work very well, they do have drawbacks. Um, I'll then outline the new design idea, which is called bistable liquid crystal displays. I'll tell you what that is. Um, so I'll tell you the proposed device design that people out there are thinking about. Um, try and give you some flavor of how we model these things mathematically. Um, and also tell you about how once you've got a model for a basic uh, device, how you might optimize the basic design that you have with regard to certain desired properties. And then I'll just summarize and uh, draw some conclusions. And then, then you can have lunch. 
Okay, so um, mathematics in the real world actually has um, quite a long and successful history, and that's particularly true in the UK. Um, there's a series of meetings called the European Study Groups with Industry, or ESGI, and these meetings were um, initiated in Oxford in the 1960s, and since then they've proved so popular and so useful that they're taken off worldwide. So there are now similar study groups in the USA, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, even Saudi Arabia, India, and China now. So really a worldwide thing. And the format is very simple. It's a week-long meeting. Um, industrious, industrialists come along to the meeting, and on the first day, they describe a problem, a real-world problem that they're having in their industry that they want mathematical input. And then essentially for the rest of the week, uh, mathematicians, that's faculty, postdocs, graduate students, and even some undergraduates these days, uh, just spend the rest, of, the rest of the week brainstorming in groups, working on these problems. And at the end of the week, they'll give a summary presentation on the progress that they've made. So it's great fun, um, and it's also very useful for industrialists. They come back year after year and present problems. Uh, in fact, there's one in just a couple of weeks to be held at the University of East Anglia. That's the 85th such meeting, so that shows you how many of these there have been. Um, and the format's also been so successful in industry that it's been extended very successfully to real-world biomedical problems. They have uh, biomedical study groups these days now, also study groups in the plant sciences, so it's, there's really a lot of real-world problems out there that math mathematicians work on. And uh, just really to illustrate the vastly diverse range of these real-world problems that mathematicians study at these meetings, I'll just give you the list of what was considered at the um, ESGI last year. So they had seven problems, as you see, that ranged from um, melting of silicon. Um, Airbus wanted to know how to better schedule um, air transport. Uh, the Atomic Weapons Establishment, with, with the great acronym OR. Um, and modeling uh, explosives. Pfizer has pharmaceutical problems, problems with the electricity grid, um, algorithmic problems, and uh, contaminant transport problems. So you see they're drawn from all areas, um, and there's a lot of, um, a lot of mathematical input to, to, be, um, to be given here. Um, I wasn't actually at that meeting last year, but I have been at many of these meetings in the past, and this is just a selection of the problems that I personally worked on. So I looked at ma ma magnetically targeted drug delivery. If you have a tumor, obviously it's very bad to deliver drugs systemically because these drugs are quite toxic. So the idea is that if you can put a magnet close to the sides of the tumor and attach the drug to magnetic particles, then you can uh, target the drug locally in that way. So I've looked at mathematical modeling of that problem. Um, pregnancy testing kits, you wouldn't think there's much mathematics there, but there is. You can uh, investigate the feasibility and uh, efficiency of um, ideas for such kits. I've worked quite a lot on manufacturing glass sheets and fibers. You know, typically when you're manufacturing glass, it's in the molten state, so it flows like a fluid. Um, and there's a lot of uh, mathematical uh, modeling of fluid dynamics that's very useful here. Um, extraction of oil from underground reservoirs. That was a problem brought, brought by Schlumberger to a study group. Um, I also these days work on mathematical modeling of tissue engineering. Again, that was brought to one of these uh, meetings. So you see there's all kinds of areas where, uh, what, you know, where people want the input of mathematics, really in a predictive capacity. Um, and I would say that successful mathematical modeling essentially always requires input from other disciplines. So it's mathematics, but we're drawing on physics, chemistry, ideas from biology, um, ideas from engineering science in, in the construction of these mathematical models. So on to today's problem, um, which as I said is about trying to build a better liquid crystal display device. And this problem I first heard about actually from Hewlett Packard. Um, obviously they're very well known for their printers, but you know, as e-ink and electronic media are growing in popularity, people are printing less, and that's, that's good really, um, because you know, Paper is a, a, a valuable resource, and we don't want to waste it. Uh, but for people who make printers, that's bad news, unless they can uh, diversify into other areas. So Hewlett Packard has an interest in elect electronic displays. And in particular, what they would like to be able to design is low power but high optical quality displays based on liquid crystal technology that might compete with e-ink out there. So what I've shown here is um, that's an Amazon Kindle. This is obviously an iPhone. Um, they both work very well in their, um, in their individual ways, but the Amazon Kindle might, uh, you know, its battery might last for several weeks, um, whereas the iPhone battery gets drained very quickly. And um, that's one of the things. This Amazon Kindle is actually a bi-stable technology. I'm going to tell you more about that. 
uh, whereas to power the display on this iPhone, um, you need to keep power applied constantly. So it's energy expensive. Um, so from that point of view, it's not such a good, um, a good model. Um, so what I want to try and do in this talk is to show what mathematics can offer here, in particular on the low power side of things. And uh, looking ahead, before I tell you the basics of liquid crystals, this is going to be the, the key idea from physics that we're going to draw on uh, when we construct our mathematical model, is the idea of free energy minimization. Okay, So free energy you can think of as the energy that a physical system has uh, available to convert to other forms. Um, that's one way to think about it. Uh, but really the, the key principle that you need to know about is that when a physical system is in a stable equilibrium state, then its total free energy is minimized. And this schematic here is quite a nice way to think about it. If you think about balls moving around on some kind of curved surface, uh, then I'm sure you'd agree that a ball would be quite happy to sit at either state one or three, okay? because those are sort of local minima. Uh, it could, in principle, balance at the point two, but the slightest knock would push it off, and it would fall into either of those wells, one or three. And uh, you can really think of this um, kind of ball on a surface idea as translating directly into uh, the free energy of that system. I'm having trouble with this pointer, but that E is supposed to denote the free energy there. And you can think of this shape here as really representing the free energy of the ball in various states. And the states where it's happy to sit in are these states where the free energy is locally minimized. Okay? And this picture also demonstrates quite nicely the idea that a system uh, may be very happy to be in more than one stable state. It would be equally happy to be in state one or state three, not in state two. Okay? And um, so, there are, so one of the ideas that we'll be talking about is um, whether or not a system can have two local minima in the free energy. And if it can, can I get from state one to state three? In other words, by jumping over that hump two and back again. Okay, so this is a nice schematic to have in your head as you, as you think about the problem. OK, so um, on to the particular application we're thinking about, which is liquid crystals and their application in display devices. So um, I'll try and keep uh, from using too many acronyms, but two that I will use are NLCs for pneumatic liquid crystals. They are a, a type of liquid crystal commonly used in display devices, and also LCDs, liquid crystal displays. Okay. So pneumatic liquid crystals, uh, what are they? Well, they flow like a liquid, as the name suggests, liquid crystal, but they do have some crystalline character. Um, and they typically consist of rod-like molecules, as shown in this little schematic here, which like to align with their neighbors. So just in terms of thinking about the difference between pneumatic liquid crystals and a solid and a liquid, in a solid there's this rigid, uh, very ordered structure. There's both positional and orientational order of the molecules. In a liquid there's no order of any kind at all. It's totally isotropic. In a liquid crystal, there is uh, orientational order, but not really positional order. So these things like to line up in the absence of other effects. And uh, mathematically, um, again, I'm going to try and keep the equations to the minimum, but um, I did this as a mathematics talk, so we need a few. Uh, mathematically, you, we describe this local direction of orientation by um, a director field, which you can think of as being a unit vector. It's always a unit vector in the theory. And we'll just restrict to two space dimensions to keep things simple. So um, a unit vector in two space dimensions, you can always write in terms of a single angle theta. So sine theta, cosine theta. And this is a unit vector because you know that sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. So the absolute value of that vector is always 1. Um, so this director orientation, which is this angle theta, is actually the angle that the molecules make with the vertical, if you like to think of it that way. Um, well, as well as the molecules liking to be parallel to each other, they like to do certain things at boundaries. So boundary effects are going to be important when you put this thing in a, um, in a confined geometry. This idea is known as surface anchoring. And the orientation of the molecules also depends on the presence of electric fields. And that's, um, these are really key ideas in the use of liquid crystals and display devices. Okay, the, the other key thing is uh, this idea of birefringence. Okay, so, um, Another property that pneumatic liquid crystals have is that they can rotate the plane of polarized light. That's what birefringence means. And the amount of, by which they do this depends on the molecular orientation. Okay, so what's the significance of that? Well, if you think of these blue things here as being polarizers, then the first one 
um, kind of polarizes light in a vertical plane. Okay, so those lines um, represent the direction of polarization. So you pass a light beam through, the only thing that can pass uh, through it is light that's pol polarized in the vertical plane. So if you put a second polarizer uh, at 90 degrees to that, then that light beam cannot pass through the second polarizer because it's polarized in the wrong direction. Okay? That's if you have an isotropic medium between those two crossed polarizers. If I had a liquid crystal between them, then this light here could get rotated, the polarization could be rotated, and some of it could pass through that second polarizer. And how much that happens depends on the molecular orientation. So if you can control the molecular orientation, you can control what comes out the other side. So that's the idea that's being used in a conventional liquid crystal display. Okay. Very simply, if you think of an individual pixel in a liquid crystal display, that's what's being schematized here, um, it's really just a thin layer, very thin, it's just a few microns, sandwiched uh, between cross polarizers. So here, those are my uh, green, um, green banding surfaces there. So the liquid crystal sandwiched between those. And you'll see in the left-hand picture, there's no electric field applied, okay? And the liquid crystals have a certain preferred orientation here at this boundary. That's those boundary effects I told you about. And they have a different preferred, this point is really giving me problems, but they have a different preferred orientation at the top. Um, and so there'll be some deformation of the liquid crystal molecules as we go across this layer. That can have the effect of rotating the polarization of this light beam, as is indicated. And so even though these polarizers are crossed at 90 degrees, uh, light can still come out the bottom because the light beam is being rotated. Okay? Whereas in the right-hand picture here, we've applied an electric field. And what that's done is it's aligned the molecules of the liquid crystal with the electric field. That's the effect it tends to have. In this configuration here, um, the, the, pol the, light beam, uh, the polarized light beam is not rotated, and so it's blocked by that second cross polarizer. The idea is that by applying an electric field, you can either get an on state or an off state in terms of the light passing through the layer. And that gives you really the basis of contrast in a display. If you can control, if you can make two adjacent pixels do something different, you have optical contrast. That's really the key idea. And so in a conventional liquid crystal display, what you do is you build the display by make, taking many such cells. Um, one cell is just one pixel in your display. And you can just apply appropriate electric fields to each. Um, now, the problem is that if you remove the field, the liquid crystal will revert back to um, that left-hand state in the picture there. There's only one state for it to go back to. So the minute you remove the field, you lose all contrast in your display. Okay? Um, so that means that the conventional de design is quite expensive in terms of power consumption, because if we're going to maintain the display, we need to keep the power applied constantly. Okay? Um, so the, a very nice idea to, um, would be that if we could, um, if we had two states, a choice of two states for the liquid crystal to relax back to that looked different when you shone light through, um, then you could sustain optical contrast without a constant power supply. Okay? So this is this idea of two um, free energy minima for the system, and that's what we mean by bi-stability. Bi just means two, two stable states for the system. Okay. So in terms of our original schematic, what we need, and I haven't told you anything about the physics yet, or, or not very much, we do need a system of liquid crystals that exhibits at least two local minima in the free energy. We need to be able to switch controllably between those states. It's no use having two stable states if you can't um, change your device from one display to another. Um, that would be done by applying an electric field, but just zapping it temporarily. Um, so we'd only have to apply power when we need to switch the display, and we'd only have to apply power to those pixels that need to be changed. So that would be very cheap energetically. And this would obviously be especially useful. I mean, it's not much use if you're watching a movie or something, obviously, because the display is moving constantly. You'd need the power applied all the time. But for an e-reader type application, um, something to compete with a Kindle, for example, which is different technology, um, where the display is intended to sustain the same format for some length of time, in a situation like that, you'd get quite significant power savings and a longer battery lifetime. So that's the kind of application we're thinking about. OK, so um, here's where the mathematics starts to come in, because we want to um, build a simple mathematical model of a, a, such a device, and in particular one pixel within such a device, um, making lots of simplifying assumptions. We want the simplest model possible, really. Um, so. 
we're going to look at a 2D model. I already said that. So all vectors and everything are just two-dimensional. Um, so my two dimensions are going to be that's supposed to be x. It somehow got chopped off. And the vertical coordinate is z. Um, so we have a planar cell um, with bounding surfaces at z equals 0. That's uh, this bottom line here. And the top surface is z equals h. And from the point of view of that schematic earlier, we're thinking of shining light from top to bottom across the cell. OK, so um, this is kind of your cross section of your pixel. Um, as I said before, we're looking at a two-dimensional director field. So that vector n, which is the local direction of your molecules, is described in terms of a single angle theta. We'll assume there's no variation in properties in the x direction. So there's really just one variable z to worry about in um, terms of things varying spatially. Um, we'll assume that the electric field across the cell, which I've just indicated at the top there, is uniform. So I'll just take it to act in the vertical direction. So it's the, that, that vector electric field E is just some scalar E times the unit vector 0, 1. Actually, I guess that's going vertically upwards rather than vertically downwards, as I sketched there, but it doesn't really matter. Um, now, this is an assumption because in reality, the electric field does interact with the liquid crystal, uh, but it's not a bad approximation. It's a good starting point. OK, so. Um, so we need to start thinking in a little bit more detail now about the physics of pneumatic liquid crystals if we're going to write down a model for it. And uh, one of the key properties for a display device of this kind is um, surface anchoring. As I mentioned, when you have liquid crystals at a solid surface, they like to take a certain angle. They might like to be parallel or perpendicular to the surface. That's known as surface anchoring. OK, so at a solid surface, they have a preferred orientation. And this anchoring angle, which I'll call alpha, so again, alpha is just, um, if you think of this as being the preferred orientation, the angle alpha would be the angle between that preferred direction and the vertical. And you can control it experimentally. Um, there's all kinds of surface treatments out there. If you um, treat a surface chemically, that might give a different preferred orientation. It turns out if you do something as simple as rubbing a surface, you take a glass surface and you rub it with a cloth, that can put microscopic grooves in the surface, and the molecules of the liquid crystal like to lie in those grooves. So that can give um, a certain preferred anchoring. Chemical treatments, ultraviolet irradiation, there's many different things you can do to a surface to change that anchoring angle. Okay, so we can think of that as being a design parameter in our problem, something we can change. Well, how do we model this anchoring? I mean, we can sort of conceptualize it in our minds, but how would you actually write down that concept in an equation? Well, bearing in mind that we're thinking of um, a system minimizing its total free energy and an equilibrium, we're going to model it using um, an energy. And um, since it acts only at the surface, this will be a surface energy in our problem. OK, so what we do is we write down a surface energy. I'm going to call it little g. It's a function of the director field. And if I know that I have a preferred direction for the director at a surface, then the surface energy that I write down should have its minimum at that preferred direction. That's what it means to be a preferred direction. It minimizes the appropriate bit of the free energy. OK? So it should have a minimum at this preferred direction, alpha. And it should, um, this surface energy G should also increase as I move away from that preferred direction. OK? Because I'm thinking of a free energy that I want to minimize. Okay, so that's, um, <clears throat> that's in words what we'll be doing. And now this surface energy, just to look ahead a little bit, that's just one contribution to the total free energy of the system. We want to minimize the total free energy. So the idea that we're thinking of is we want to minimize the total free energy, which will come from contributions from the bulk, that's the main bit of the layer, and these surface energies that I'm talking about. Okay, so just schematically, um, this is showing you surface anchoring um, in action. Here's an example where the um, preferred anchoring direction is parallel to the substrate. So in this figure A, um, the molecules like to lie in the direction 1, 0 in vectorial terms. Uh, in the picture B, they like to be vertical. So they like to be parallel to the vector 0, 1. Okay. And a very widely used form for this surface energy of liquid crystals is to say that I take a surface energy to be some negative multiple of n dot p squared, okay, where p is the favored orientation. It's that vector at angle alpha. Okay, why is that a good choice? Well, I can see 
that if I want to minimize this g, it's got a negative sign in front of it, then I should maximize n dot p squared. When is n dot p squared maximized? It's when those two vectors are parallel. So I minimize g when n is parallel to this vector p, the preferred direction. Okay? So this would be a good choice for a surface energy because I've written down something that is minimized when the director takes that preferred direction. Okay. So that's the, and that's, the, that's going to be the idea throughout is we're thinking of a, all these contributions to the free energy, write down a total free energy and then minimize that whole thing. Okay, so, so far so good. Um, now we need to think about the bulk energies because we've said how we're going to deal with surface energies. Um, and for liquid crystal display applications, there are really two important contributions to uh, the total energy in the bulk of the layer. I already told you that liquid crystal molecules like to align with each other. They like to line up with their neighbors. Um, that's called, in the, in the jargon, that's called elasticity. Essentially, it resists deformations because it would like to be in a uniform state. So that's known as an elastic contribution. Um, the other important contribution, because you know, we'll be applying an electric field to this thing to change it from one state to the other. So we also need to worry about electric field effects. And essentially, electric field has the effect of um, aligning the molecules with the applied field. So this, uh, the bulk energy I write down here should model the tendency of the molecules to line up with the applied field. So the total bulk energy that I write down is obviously going to be a function of the direct field N, that's the local molecular direction, and the applied electric field. So for now, just let's write it as some function of N and E. And so the idea is that given my electric field, my uh, surface anchoring properties, which were A and P and my surface energy, what I want to do is find the direct orientation N that minimizes this. That's my bulk energy, my surface energy. So I want to minimize that altogether. Okay? And don't worry about the details of this. It's just the, the, the sort of idea of writing down something that we're going to minimize, and that will give us equations to solve. Okay, so we also, uh, the, the final thing that I want to tell you about is this elastic contribution. Uh, actually, it's not quite the final thing. There's one more. Um, so this models the tendency of the molecules to stay parallel to each other. In other words, we want to minimize elastic distortions. So we don't want our um, director field deviating too much within the layer. So we need an appropriate term in our free energy that's minimized when there's no deviations. And um, I'm cutting out a lot of the physics here, but essentially, um, if you take a contribution to your free energy that's of the form some constant, an elastic constant, times d theta by dz squared, so it's the derivative of the angle as I go across the cell, then obviously you can see that a contribution of this form here would be minimized, in fact it would be zero, if the angle theta didn't vary at all across the cell. Okay? This is obviously minimized when the angle theta is constant. So I've written down something that's minimized when the liquid crystal is distortion free. Okay? And this is an appropriate um, measure of the elastic energy because something that's minimized when nothing's changing at all within the layer. So the final contribution that I'm going to tell you about is this dielectric effect, which is that when you apply an electric field to this layer, the molecules like to line up. Okay? And it's the same kind of ideas. Again, I need to write down an appropriate term, which I call W di dial for dielectric in my total bulk energy density. And Again, using similar ideas to the surface anchoring that I talked about, you can see that if I make this contribution some negative multiple of n dot e squared, then I obviously minimize w when n dot e squared is maximized. So again, this will be minimized when the director field is parallel to the electric field. It's minimized when n dot e is maximized, that's when the two vectors are parallel. Okay. So um, I've written down something that's minimized when uh, this vector is parallel to my electric field. And so now I've got all the components, really, that I need to write down my model. Um, so it turns out what's key, really, to, um, to the de design of this device is, um, is going to be the surface energies. Because I want something that has two stable states when there's no electric field. And really, the only way I have of controlling what the molecules do when there's no field is playing with the surfaces. Okay? 
So this is really key to the modeling. Um, so what's the idea? So I've already said that um, physicists and experimentalists can uh, do a lot of things um, with anchoring. Essentially, by treating surfaces, they can change the preferred alignment angle at a given surface if they treat them appropriately. Um, and what we'll find, just looking ahead a little bit, is that if we take those anchoring angles at the two surfaces to be different, if we choose them suitably, then we'll find we can get two stable steady states to our model. And in the appropriate parameter regime, I mean the appropriate choices of experimental parameters, uh, we will find we can switch reversibly between those states. So we're going to choose our surface energies G. We've already discussed the general form of them to, uh, to model this different anchoring. So I'm going to consider one anchoring angle, let's call it alpha 0 at the lower surface, a different one, call it alpha 1 at the upper surface. So in other words, the molecules like to do different things at the bottom surface to what they do at the top surface. Um, and we'll assume they have corresponding anchoring strengths, A0 and A1. So these parameters, capital A, just really measure how strongly the molecules like to do a certain thing at a surface. OK, so um, this gives us four quantities that we think of as being under experimental control. So we've got surface anchoring angles at each surface, surface anchoring strengths. And experimentalists can control these, so we can think of these as being design parameters. OK, so this is the worst slide in terms of equations. You really don't need to remember the details, but I'm just showing you how we put all this together. OK? So once you've scaled coordinates, this is just a mathematical nicety, but I've scaled coordinates now, so my cell lies between z equals 0 and z equals 1. That just puts the h into the equations rather than um, me having to worry about it separately. So this w is all the contributions to my bulk energy density. Right? I've talked about all those contributions. Actually, I didn't talk about this one, but I don't have time to. That's a flexoelectric contribution. So that's my elasticity contribution, the first one. That's my dielectric one. This is the flexoelectric one I haven't told you about. These are my two surface energies. Clearly, this one is minimized when theta is alpha 0. This one is minimized when theta is alpha 1. So everything is minimized at the appropriate point, as it should be. And these parameters are F and D capture, well, they capture things like the device thicknesses in there, that H. The elastic constant K is in there, but crucially, really, uh, the electric field E. So when you see that F, just think it's proportional to E, and that D is proportional to E squared. Okay? So mathematically, all we want to do is minimize the total free energy of our system, which is this expression here. You just have to integrate your bulk energy density across the layer, add in the two surface energies. Okay? You want to minimize that. Okay? That's an exercise in calculus, essentially. It's calculus with a twist, but that's all you do. So once you've written that down, you get a simple differential equation that tells you how your director angle changes across the layer. Okay? And you'll see this contains a term in D there. That means uh, the electric field effect. If I turn the electric field off, I'd set D to 0. I'd have a very simple differential equation. And rather nasty boundary conditions. So I have to impose these conditions on 0 and 1. Okay? But it's really just an ordinary differential equation. If you haven't seen those before, don't worry too much about it. I'm assuming that most of you know at least what d theta by dz is. It's just how theta is changing as we go across the cell. OK, so we want solutions. We want a bistable device. We want a device that has two stable states when there's no field. OK, so these are the equations when I have a field. Um, so why don't I just turn the field off, set d and f to 0. So I knock out those terms there. And once I do that, um, you can see that a theta that's linear in z will solve that equation, okay? Because if theta is linear in z, I differentiate twice, I get 0, okay? Again, the details aren't so important, but um, essentially I have two unknowns a and b, and now I find those by substituting in my boundary conditions. But anyway, the key thing is those equations are actually not that important. What's, what's important for, from your point of view is that there's more than one solution in general to these equations, okay? More than one solution. And I'll just show you what those are. So um, on the left, you have one of the stable states. So these big arrows now are just showing you what the molecular direction is doing locally. Um, and I have one solution here, one solution there. Each of those are perfectly good solutions to that equation that I wrote down. So they both represent minima of the free energy of my system. And I've just shown it you for so 
relatively randomly chosen parameter values there. Okay, so these two steady states will form um, the two basic states of the device. But there's several requirements because it's not enough that we just have two stable steady states. You have to be able to switch from one to the other and back again. Um, so that's the first requirement. It must be possible to switch from one state to the other and back again by applying an electric field for some short period of time. Uh, secondly, when you actually pass light through the layer, they should look different. So they should be optically distinct, okay? Because otherwise, it's, it's not much use. Um, these are somewhat more minor requirements, but we like uh, fast switching for visual display applications. You don't want to wait two minutes to turn one page of your Kindle. You'd like it to happen in a microsecond, preferably. We'd like to be able to switch at quite low electric fields on the grounds of economy, because the whole point of this idea is to save energy. And we should be able to, this is somewhat of a technicality, but we should be able to do it for reasonably large anchoring strengths, because otherwise the device won't be robust to shocks. You drop it and it might switch from one state to the other and back again. So the anchoring strength should be reasonably strong. Okay, so how do we look at switching them? Um, well, I had those differential equations. I'm not going to show you again, but um, they did have parameters in there that depend on the electric field, okay? So what I want to do now is let that electric field in there vary in time in the way that I've shown you at the bottom here. So I want to think of applying a constant electric field for a certain period of time and then turning it off, okay? And I want to see what effect that has on solutions to my differential equation. So what I'll do is I'll solve those differential equations. I'll start, let's say I start with state N1 and I apply the electric field for a fixed period of time. I turn the field off and then I ask, have I switched to N2 or not? And I can do the same thing starting from N2, apply a field for some time, have I switched to N1, okay? And if I get switching, that's good because it means that I can apply an electric field to change my device controllably from one state to the other. And what we find is uh, very hopeful and promising because we do find, and now, um, now what you're seeing is the director field from the bottom of the device to the top of the device as a function of time. So at the left, you'll see the initial state that I start with. I then apply an electric field for this, um, for this period of time here. I take the electric field away, and you'll see that in both cases, it changes from one state to the other once I remove the field. Okay, so on the left-hand picture, I started with uh, this state, I switch to this state. Here I started with this state here, I zap it with a field and I can switch to the other state. So I can switch reversibly, which is good, and I can do it relatively fast. It, that took about 0.1 seconds, which is slow for a liquid crystal display, but it's not terrible. Um, but I really only chose parameter values by trial and error here. I just plucked these out of the air, see if they work, and if they work, that's good, okay? So it's promising, but we'd like to get best results. We'd like to do this as well as we can. We'd like to optimize um, this design. Okay, so how do we go about optimizing it? Well, first of all, we need to think what a manufacturer could control. So what parameters are available to us for this optimization? Um, well, I've already said that the um, experimentalists can change things like anchoring properties, either by changing the liquid crystal used or by treating the surface. So we can think of the anchoring angles and anchoring strengths as being uh, under our control. We can obviously also control the applied field, both the size of the field and the time for which we apply it. So those are two more um, design parameters that we can think about uh, trying to optimize with respect to. Okay, so what's our strategy? Well, we want to systematically search the parameter space of anchoring angles, alpha zero, alpha one, one at each boundary anchoring strengths, one at each boundary, um, and the applied field strength, and the applied field duration. And in that space of controllable parameters, we want to find the best such device. Okay, what do we mean by best? How do we formulate that mathematically? Okay, well this is an optimization problem, and there's lots of um, approaches to optimization. The approach we took is to define a what we call a benefit function uh, B, it's something that we want to maximize, okay? Now, how do we decide what we want to maximize? Well, we try and put into this benefit function all the things that we think are good, okay? We want to maximize the goodness of this device. Well, I already said that for technical reasons, we need to um, maximize surface energies at which this will operate. So I want to maximize my allowable surface energies. 
I want to maximize contrast. Well, that's some function of these director fields, N1 and N2. I haven't written it down because it's somewhat complicated, but it's a known function of the two steady states, the contrast between them. So I'd like to maximize that as well. On the other hand, I'd like to minimize the switching field, Emax, because I don't want to use too much energy. And I'd also like to minimize the time it takes to switch, which is really the time for which we apply the electric field. So I'd like to minimize that as well. OK, so I can write down a function um, that when I maximize it will simultaneously take account of all those effects. And obviously, in general, there's some trade-off, because you might not be able to have um, high anchoring strengths and high contrast together. They might be competing effects. But I can put them all into my function. So I would like to maximize the lower of those two surface energies, because I want both of them to be large. I want to maximize my contrast, so I put in some multiple of the contrast there. I want to minimize uh, the switching field strength, so I put in some negative multiple of the maximum field there. And I want to minimize the switching time, so again, that goes with a minus sign in there. And if I maximize this function, I'm somehow accounting for all of those desirable properties together. Okay. So that's what we do. We maximize in a six-dimensional parameter space. Well, Christian said you can't visualize four dimensions. You certainly can't visualize six dimensions. So um, the schematic here just shows you a maximization problem in two dimensions. So if I had a benefit function that depended on just two parameters, um, this is what the surface it defines might look like. And what I'm trying to do, obviously, is uh, find a local, the best design locally. I'm trying to find the highest point on the surface defined by my benefit function. OK, well, how do we do this? It's a function of six variables. I'm sure you could all maximize a function of one variable. You just differentiate it, set the derivative to 0, and you find whether it's a maximum or a minimum. It's the same kind of idea in six dimensions, but you know, for a six-dimensional function, you can't do it analytically, especially not uh, as complicated a function as this. So what we end up doing is using gradient methods. It's actually a simulated annealing method, but that's just a technicality. But really, the idea behind gradient methods is that as you move around a surface, so, so you start from a random point on the surface, and you move around the surface always following gradients up. Okay, So if your surface is increasing, you go in that direction. You always go in the direction of maximum increase. Okay, Now, that will always lead you to a local maximum of the function. Okay, because if you always follow up a hill, you're going to end up at the top of a hill eventually. It might not be the tallest hill, but you will get to the top of a hill. Um, there's a slight technicality in terms of how you avoid stopping at a local maximum, because if I'm always following gradients up, then I would actually come to a halt when I get to the top of this hill. I'd never get off, because all directions would take me down, so I'd stop. Um, so you can stick in, I don't want to go into the details here, but you can put in some stochastic element into that gradient method, whereby you'll jump around a little bit as you move around the surface. And that, and a, that, that essentially stops you um, from stopping at a local maximum. Um, so what we do, because, because essentially when, when, you, you know, when you do a method like this, you don't know in, in advance where the maximum is going to be. So you have to choose somewhere on your surface to start and follow the gradient around. And you hope you end up at the local maximum. Okay, That's not guaranteed. So um, what you do is you actually choose lots of different starting points on your surface. You follow those around, and you see how many times you end up at a certain value of the benefit function. Okay, So that's what we do here. We've done lots of different simulations um, from different starting points on the surface. And we just made a histogram for the value of the function that we converged to and how many times that happened. And what you'll see is that most of the time, we ended up at this very well-defined maximum value of the function. Like 90 times out of 100, we ended up at this value here. And we say that's the global optimum of this benefit function that we wrote down. So you've got a well-defined global maximum. The majority of our simulations find this. And that's great, because once you've done that, you can just read off the opt. You don't really care what the value of the, this benefit function is. What you care is which parameters gave you that value. So we know that the maximum is 2.8. So, so what? Well, what we want to know is which alpha 0, which alpha 1, which a 0, which a 1, which e max, which t field gave me that value of the benefit function. And those are the parameters that we should feed in to our design. OK? So you can just read that off. All this is done computationally, of course. You can read off those values from your computer code. And that will tell the experimentalist the best design, at least according to those criteria we put in our benefit function. 
And just to show you that we did that, um, this is actually the switching simulation for the best solution that we found for that benefit function that we wrote down. So again, you're just looking at how the director field varies as a function of time with the applied field. But that's essentially um, th what I wanted to tell you today. So just uh, to wrap up, um, what we've done is we proposed um, a bistable device. So it's quite different to um, all pneumatic liquid crystal devices that are out there. They require constant application of power. We've got a bistable one that should dramatically um, lower energy consumption. And what it really relies on is this principle that you can change the surface anchoring at the two bounding surfaces. We saw that trial and error simulations, I mean, if you just choose these parameters randomly, trial and error, um, well, you, you find that two-way switching is possible, um, but it's essentially impossible to um, optimize your design using trial and error alone, because there's six parameters to vary. That's a huge space to search. You'd never do it. Um, so that gave us the idea of optimizing that model to find the best anchoring angles and strengths, the ones that maximize allowable surface energies for device robustness, maximize contrast, visuals, uh, minimize the switching field, that's economy and the time of application, economy, visuals, user patience, all that kind of thing, all while permitting two-way switching. So we optimized for that chosen benefit function. And I'd just like to emphasize, really, that um, you'll see in this benefit function, I have these parameters mu, multiplying the contrast, nu, multiplying the maximum field, and gamma, multiplying the switching time. Obviously, if you think any one of those uh, features is more important than the other, all you need to do is increase the value of the associated parameter. If you think contrast is really, really important in your device, then set that mu to be 100 and make the other values small, because that will mean that an increase in contrast will have a huge effect on your benefit function. So the maximum will almost certainly be one that has very good contrast, and so on. So depending on what you think is most important, uh, you can tweak the values of those parameters and um, change the model accordingly. Um, so I would just say that general, the general optimization principle is, is a pretty powerful and versatile uh, method mathematically. Um, bottom line, though, of course, is uh, this is all purely theoretical. Um, the mathematics says the device should work, but no one's actually tried this uh, experimentally yet. So experimental verification is still needed on all this. So um, thanks for your attention. I'd like to thank uh, my collaborators back in NJIT. Chen Jing Kai is the graduate student who's been working on this project. Um, I have a collaborator at University of Southampton, Giles Richardson. Chris Newton and Tim Spiller from Hewlett Packard were the people who first told us about this problem. And of course, thanks to Meet the Mathematicians for funding this event. Thank you. So any quick questions perhaps for Linda? I'm sure they'd rather have lunch. Okay, we're all looking forward to lunch. But before we go, let me introduce uh, the mass busters. They just want to say hello for a couple of minutes and then we'll take you over to lunch. We're allowed to perform. Right.
by removing one, two, or three pegs from David's top, and I will respond by removing one, two, or three pegs from the top, and it can carry on like that. But the last peg to be removed is the one with. Can you check that it's actually a real 20 quid note? Yes. It looks real to me. Yes. Great. Yes. Yes. Okay. Right. <laughs> right. 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 So, Daniel, Daniel, can I get you to stand up on this side and give you a beautiful smile towards the audience? Yes. yes. Great. And David, one, two, or three pegs. Actually, Daniel, Daniel, one, two, or three pegs. This is the last one, and then I'll report to the back. Okay? <laughs> Thinking of taking the money, but no. Too many people watching, yes? One peg? One peg? No more? No more, no pink ones, just one green one. Okay, now, I'm gonna, mm, I kind of like the pink ones, especially <laughs> this one. Uh, okay, so let me see, I'll take one, yeah, yeah, big one, big one, maybe a bit greedy, oh, I'm gonna be a bit greedy, I'm gonna take three pegs. Daniel, one peg. Are you sure, just one peg? No, no pink ones. You, you, you stick to the green, green ones. Okay. So I'll, I'll clear the pink ones for you. Okay. And uh, that one. Oh, 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 oh. What happened there? Why did you say? Oh. <laughs> Can I have someone to volunteer an explanation for the? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Why? What did I do? Go on, no matter. I like to win no option. I was mathematically evil towards you. I was not, yes. So I know the rules of the game, and I want Daniel to have a huge round of applause because he's great.